While episodes 4, 5, and 6 weren't as viscerally emotional as 1, 2, and 3, episode 4 definitely starts it off with a bang. There's a lot of really interesting scriptural moments here, as well as just some of the best writing that The Chosen has ever done. Episode 4 holds a lot of really amazing moments for the show, things we've been waiting for for years, and others that we didn't know that we were going to see. There's a lot of really unique, cool things in this episode, including a pretty large mistake made by the Chosen team that they're actually going to have to fix before it comes out on streaming services. As my last couple of episodes were nearly an hour each, definitely buckle up and get some snacks and get ready to dive into every little detail of episode 4 as I walk you through every single scene. Now, of course, it goes without saying, that there are obviously spoilers coming up in this episode as well as spoilers for episodes one two and three so you shouldn't be watching this if you haven't seen them already unless you're just that type of spoiler hungry person now i know from personal experience that these episodes can get really mixed up very easily but i'm here to set the record straight and to tell you exactly what happened in each episode so that you have a better idea of what you've just watched if you've watched it in theaters i know it can get really tiring sitting there for nearly four hours watching these amazing shows and trying to keep everything straight so let's just jump into episode four and talk about it right from the beginning as the music builds and we get into episode episode four we hear the romans speaking out a decree against quintus now of course he is being demoted and kicked out of Capernaum completely he's going to be returning to rome to attend a tribunal uh judgment of his fate after what he's done killing a civilian in cold blood now of course the romans would have killed people in general but normally there was law in order to this normally it would be that they went through some sort of trial and they were shown to be a criminal or something else in the roman society it wasn't just that romans were going around killing anybody that they saw at least not normally so this definitely would have been a punishment that would have been applicable during the time of jesus here and quintus of course is feeling the wrath of the roman government as he has now just overstepped his authority we see as atticus actually takes off the necklace the magistrate necklace that quintus wears and holds it in his own hands now, at first, some people thought that Atticus might become the new leader of this area, but if you've watched my previous video, you know exactly what I thought was going to happen. And this is when we see Gaius come in to Quintus's old office. As they pass each other, they give each other kind of confused and worried looks, not knowing exactly what's going to happen. And then as Gaius has his handcuffs and wraps kind of taken off of his hands, he realizes that he is not being punished, but he's free. Atticus then puts the necklace that he took from Quintus over Gaius's head and calls him Praetor Gaius. That's when Gaius is free to roam about the room and sit in his new office without saying a word again. I loved this portion of the episode because the writing obviously is non-existent other than what's happening in the scene there's no dialogue here that really carries it and so kirk who plays gaius did an amazing job showing his confusion showing his his emotions as he's kind of wondering what is happening here you know uh, very gently kind of stepping into the office and understanding that now he's the authority this is going to come in really clutch at the end of the episode when we see a book end that is very very similar then we jump into where we left off in the last episode of course after rama's death there's something that needs to happen with her body in jewish culture the body is extremely important because they believe in a physical resurrected body that's going to come back and so they want to preserve these bodies as much as possible that's why they have ossuaries and different areas where they keep the bones of the dead in order for them to be raised up during the resurrection uh, at the end of the day so it's really interesting here to see Rama's body being carried by the group on a cart to Teldor and the thoughts that must be going in each of their heads this scene is really interesting because it's unlike anything we've seen from the chosen really before where they're diving into each individual person's thoughts first we start with simon peter then we go to mary magdalene thomas john and we kind of jump around seeing each of their thoughts and what happened in the last few days as they're going to tell door first off we start with peter this is directly after the death of rama and they don't know what to do at all Thomas is freaking out, breathing heavily and hyperventilating. He is really, really in the midst of some pain. We see as the rest of the group is obviously crying and mourning and in shock at what just happened. And Peter is talking with Jesus about how he can be the leader here, how he can be the rock. Now, Peter doesn't fully understand what his role is quite yet. He know that Jesus called him 
to be some sort of leader, but he's not exactly sure how that plays out in this group right now, especially in this specific moment. He asks Jesus, how can I be the rock? How can I be the rock in this moment to Thomas? How can I be that steady ground for him? And Jesus is telling him that's probably not what Thomas needs right now. What Thomas needs is for someone to be there with him. And you have experienced this pain. And so that's all you need to do is just be there with Thomas. And so that's what Peter does. He goes up and he puts his hand on his chest as Thomas lays on the ground and he breathes heavily. And Peter tries to calm him down, tries to have this moment with him. Next, we see as Mary is walking on the road and we go into her thoughts back at that moment as well. She thinks to herself the shame and grief that she has because maybe it's her fault that Rayma died. What if she had kept a better eye on her? What if she had kept her closer? She had her hand while they were in the crowd and she just lost her somehow. And then that's when Thomas grabbed her and Quintus stabbed her. This is a hard thing for Mary because she doesn't know what to do here. Is this her fault? Was she responsible for this? And Tamar tries to kind of talk her down off of that you know, uh, telling her things like we can't go there and, and no, of course, like that's not what's happening here. She's trying to help her kind of process through this. Now, Mary asks some really hard questions here as well, like asking why didn't Jesus heal her and couldn't he have done that? Couldn't he have prevented this from happening in the first place? And all of them are kind of asking questions like this throughout the entire episode. It's really intense because it's the questions that we ask as well. When we encounter hardships and pain in our lives, we ask the same question. Jesus, why did you allow this to happen? And the truth is that God just knows better than us. His outcomes are always better while they're not always easier. And that's just the way that it is. Next, we go into John's thoughts and what he's processing through all of this. This scene actually takes place not in the field where Thomas is grieving, but in Peter's house later on that day. We see as John and Big James and Peter have a conversation talking about why this happened. Now, remember, these three are key to the future of the chosen storytelling and to the gospels themselves. These three are the closest to Jesus that we see throughout scripture. They are there for the very important moments that we see you know, throughout the ministry of Jesus, whether that be the healing of Jairus's daughter, the resurrection from the dead, or the transfiguration later on. Um, there's a lot of different things where these three in particular are the closest to Jesus and spend the most amount of intimate time with him. This is really interesting as we see this kind of played out in The Chosen. They're not saying this outright, that these three, of course, are the closest, but we're seeing it over and over again as these three have moments that others do not. For example, this scene here, as they talk about why didn't Jesus heal her? Why didn't he intervene? We saw him resurrect Jairus' daughter. Why wouldn't he do that for Rhema here? Is Jairus' daughter more important than Rhema or even Peter's unborn child as he lost last season? These are really, really hard questions to ask and to answer, but they're not really asking the right people, are they? <laughs> they're not asking Jesus they're asking each other these questions because they're kind of afraid to approach Jesus with this. But Peter reminds them throughout this conversation that they are his students. They're not his peers. So they shouldn't be acting as if they understand everything as well as Jesus does. And they should ask him. They should learn from him in these moments. And so you can really see as Peter is beginning to grow more and more throughout this conversation. It's really interesting that he brings up Isaiah 55 as well that says, you know, my thoughts are your, not your thoughts, and, and neither are your ways my ways. And if we look into this, it says right here, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. This is the verse that Peter goes into when he starts thinking about this, knowing that Jesus is God, knowing that Jesus is so much higher thoughts than his, so much higher ways than his, and he could never understand fully what is going on here, at least not in a human sense. Two things that I found really compelling here that we're going to see in the climax of this season is one, the guys talk about what if he heals someone else? What if he raises someone else? Thomas is going to be devastated. Of course, this is foreshadowing for when Lazarus will be raised later this season. And Peter also says later in this conversation that he trusts the God who walks on water. Again, reaffirming that statement we saw him make in episode two, where he says that 
Jesus is the Christ. He is the son of God. Um, and understanding that, you know, God revealed that to him. And now he understands that in his, in his life here, that Jesus is God. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a good rabbi. He's not just a healer but he is God. Now here in this moment, Peter actually gives Big James and John a huge hug and embraces them for quite a while. We see this is actually a callback for Dallas to a moment that he experienced with his father at a funeral. This is from a commentary video that he released during the first three episodes. Um, there's a QR code that you could scan and watch this scene with commentary. So I thought that, that was really, really interesting. Um, really, really cool to get some unique insight behind the writing of this moment here. Now, after the first half of this scene, Peter actually leaves and we get a mini scene with James and John as well, where James kind of admits to being jealous of Thomas last season as John and him were getting really close. But he kind of bolsters John and tells him that you are the only person that Thomas needs to see right now. You're the only person that Thomas needs to be with as you're pretty much his best friend here. Peter is the leader of the group, but John is really Thomas's best friend and closest uh, person within the group as a whole. So it's really important that he is the one to walk alongside Thomas here. And so from there, we kind of zoom out of the scene that we were in, in John's head. And we see as he does make that move forward to take Peter's place next to Thomas on the cart that is housing Rayma's body. And last but not least, we get the most emotional flashback and that is of Thomas himself. We, as we zoom into that moment again, right when Peter is comforting him, he actually stands up and he just cannot calm down. In fact, he doesn't want to calm down. He says it feels wrong to breathe when she can't. And he also says that he can't relax. In fact, he doesn't want to relax. It's really overwhelming for him. You see him hyperventilating and Joey did an amazing job on this scene. The actor who plays Thomas, really, really great stuff. Showing that emotion and that exasperation, that desperation of where he is in that moment. He doesn't know what to do. He's just kind of walking around, pacing, running around, not knowing where to go or how to cope with what's happening here. At that moment, he actually runs to Jesus in one of the most amazing moments of this opener, and he hugs him, and Jesus just embraces him. And of course, Peter and some of the other apostles stand around as well. And at one point, Jesus actually passes Thomas off to Peter and the other apostles as they embrace him and really surround him with love. This is a huge scene because, of course, we're waiting for Thomas to run to Jesus. And it shows that, one, Thomas still trusts Jesus, but also, two, this is exactly what Jesus does for us sometimes. As we run to Jesus, he gives us people to surround us. He gives us people to comfort us and to lift us up in the world. And of course, while Jesus is in the world, he can do that for Thomas. But this is also symbolism that Jesus also passes us off to people in the world to allow them to hold our burdens and allow them to lift us up in times of grief and pain. Then this opener ends with Jesus saying that he sent word to tell Dor that they're going to be returning Ramah's body. And of course, this sets up for a really hard scene to come. That's when we see the intro theme play, and then we come back to the road to Teldor as the rest of them are getting ready to confront Rama's family and the people of her town. As we see Jesus leading the apostles and the caravan to Teldor, we see the cart with Thomas and John on either side pushing as Simon the Zealot is pulling from the front of the cart as well. As they get closer, they begin to see some people on the horizon, and Thomas begins to ask questions like, I don't know how I'm going to approach Kofni. And that's when they say, you may not need to. As they see Kofni is in the front of this crowd of people walking towards the caravan. Now, this was really an intense scene overall. Kofni, of course, is Rama's father. And you can see that his demeanor is very different than what we've seen him before. We've always seen him very kind of stern and confident, always against what Rama was wanting to do following Jesus and what Thomas was trying to do. He knew that this was unsafe and dangerous, and now he's been proven correct. 
You can see that the last few days he hasn't gotten any sleep. There's huge bags under his eyes and the makeup and costuming here is so well done. Um, very, very, very cool. Now he's not in mourning quite yet. We don't see him like with ripped clothes and ashes all over himself. Um, although that's probably because he's wanting to verify that Rama is actually dead before they enter Shiva and go into what they were going to do there. Um, however, it's definitely shown that he is in despair. He is definitely hurting right now. Right as they see Kofni, they kind of get into a little argument, kind of determining who is going to be the one to talk to him and what's going to be happening there, who's going to help Thomas kind of navigate through this time. Now, of course, John says that he'll go with him, and then Simon Z says that he'll take care of it, and they'll see what they want, and then come back and relay the message. And then Jesus says, no, I'll go with you, Thomas, as they kind of go forward. But instead, Kofni kind of comes straight towards the group, says, where is my daughter, and runs straight to the cart as he confirms that Rama is, in fact, dead. He stands there for a few seconds, mourning and crying, as the sadness turns to anger, and he completely explodes. I thought the actor who plays Kofni did an amazing job playing the father role here, as I don't know how I would feel if my daughter had died in a group like this. Someone who I don't trust, who I didn't trust, who promised me that they'd keep her safe. I would be very, very upset. And rightfully so, Kofni has the rest of his people from his town take the cart and begin walking back towards Teldor. But as Jesus and the apostles begin to follow them, he turns around and tells them that they're forbidden from entering the town. And he starts to yell at them, and this gets really intense. There are some real notable quotes here in this scene as Kofni really gets angry and the group is trying to navigate that conversation altogether. Kofni says, you have already killed me, then you went and killed her. This is referring to Rama's relationship with him in the past as she has left him to go follow Jesus. Of course, this probably feels like a death to him, at least in my opinion, and it feels like Rama is saying, you're dead to me, I'm gonna go follow Jesus. This is probably a very very kind of heavy thing that we see in Jewish culture. We saw the same thing with Matthew, right? When Matthew's father says, I have no son. And then they sit Shiva for seven days to mourn the death of their son. Even though he's not actually dead, he's abandoned them and betrayed them. That's probably how Kafni felt here as well, as he had been killed by Rama and not having her anymore. So that's kind of what he's referring to. We also see as Kafni begins to go off on the group, calling Jesus a liar and yelling at them. At one point, Thomas actually tries to defend the group and defend Rama by saying, you don't speak speak for her. She loved Jesus. She took her following Jesus as an honor, the calling to follow Jesus as an honor. Um, and this is a heavy thing. Of course, Kofni is not going to let up. He just keeps on going. And every time you think he's done, he just comes back for another round. He is very upset. Though it is really interesting to see the conversation here between Kofni and the apostles trying to navigate this. I think Simon Z is the main one who is speaking here. But Kofni says, I curse you. I curse all you and your followers. And then Simon Z says, we grieve with you. So it's this kind of like attack, attack, and then a loving response back at it. I don't think this is the end of Kofni either. There are a few things that he says nearing the end of this conversation that are really compelling and will show us uh, kind of where we see Kofni in the future as well. Uh, he says that he will move mountains to basically expose Jesus, that he's going to tell everybody that he's a liar and a murderer for killing Rama. And there's a lot more that is going to come in the future. Kofni says that you will see me again, and when you see me, it will be the last thing that you ever see. Personally, I think this is setting up Kofni to be at the crucifixion of Christ, to be at the trial with Pilate and be one of the major people that is trying to get Jesus crucified, maybe being the main person to begin the chant, crucify him crucify him. While this is a very sad story for Kofni and a very sad trajectory of where he's going, it's real. And it's really, really something that's, oh man, it's just such good writing here. I loved every minute of it. Then after the scene with Kofni, we get a montage of different scenes that come up. First, we have a demon-possessed man that is healed by Jesus. Then we see as Yusuf actually goes to Jerusalem. This is going to be a big portion of these next few episodes, not necessarily episode four, but definitely five and six, as Yusuf, we heard before, is going into the Sanhedrin. So this is really, really cool to see him kind of finally getting into this position and getting into 
a position of authority within the religious leaders, which of course is going to come into major play later on. We see a little clip of Thomas as he's struggling to get back into the swing of things. We also see as there's a blind man that is healed. Now this one in particular is a huge, huge silent callback to episode one, season one of The Chosen. This is the blind man in season one that calls out to Matthew asking if he is the Messiah. Now I was wanting a kind of a bigger scene with this character but it's cool that they added it in without being too overt i guess but i'm like 100 percent sure this is the same guy from episode one season one that was looking for the messiah but was blind and now jesus has just healed him now we don't get much context to this at all but he's healed of his blindness and little james is there standing next to jesus as well next as a continuation to kofni's promise we see him as he is instigating the people of teldor as he's telling them that Jesus is a liar and a murderer, and he's kind of inciting violence against him. We'll see where that carries on. And of course, none of these scenes have any dialogue or sound at all. It's just music kind of going on here. So we don't really know what he's saying, but we can see that he's definitely angry and inciting other people to be the same. Then we cut back to Capernaum as we see Jesus is teaching in the square, and we see a bunch of people kind of surrounding around him. Now, of course, this is another teaching moment from Jesus. This happened all the time, especially in Capernaum and Chorazim. Uh, and Bethsaida, but we do see Rabbi Akiva and the Roman soldier Julius standing nearby. And of course, Akiva is wanting to do anything that he can to shut down Jesus, especially after what happened previously when Rama died and the whole crowd went in an uproar. Uh, a very crazy moment that he, I'm sure, wants to avoid. Right after this, we see that Julius actually goes to Gaius' office and hands him a report. Now, this report is from the religious leaders kind of sharing that they want to have action taken against Jesus. And Gaius is under pressure to do so. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But what does Gaius do with this report? Well, he reads it, and then promptly he burns it. <laughs> so obviously he's not super interested in what is happening with these reports. He wants to protect Jesus, and this is our first sighting of that, at least from his position as praetor. Now, right after this montage, we get back to Peter's home, and we see all the apostles as they're kind of relaxing and talking to each other. But this is actually when we get one of the biggest mistakes in this episode overall, um, and that is... If you like this episode and you want to chat about episode four with everybody else, then go ahead and join our Patreon at snipesupport.com. This is the best place to help us to support what we do here on the channel. And of course, to just chat about what's happening in The Chosen and other Christian media as it pertains to The Chosen Sleuth. Now, of course, we've got a bunch of other stuff on there, including personal updates from our lives and different trips that we're taking and talking about our Israel trip, which is coming up very soon as well. So a lot of stuff coming on the Patreon. You don't want to miss it. You can join for as little as $5 a month and it really does help to support our ministry here we'd love to have you be a part over there so anyway let's get back to the video we get one of the biggest mistakes in this episode overall um, and that is the timing of when this all takes place we get a little text marker on the screen that tells us this is now kislev of ad 30 now kislev is a jewish month and if we go back to the time of jesus during this year that would be in the month of december now this would be completely fine if we had more time in the chosen that we were doing more ministry and different things but this is the last year of Jesus' ministry, which would mean that Jesus would be then crucified in AD 31. But we started Jesus' ministry in AD 26. So it doesn't really make sense here. This date should be AD 29, not AD 30. And no, I'm not just criticizing the show to try to criticize the show. A lot of people have different dates for the crucifixion of Jesus, but because of the earlier dates that we were given by the chosen, this AD 30 doesn't really make full sense. So I reached out to Dallas myself to ask him what was going on with this. And with some hesitancy, he did say that this is a mistake and they are going to fix it for streaming services later on. So that should be changed to Kislev of AD 29. But this timestamp, other than the mistake, is really, really Really important because it shows us exactly where we are in the calendar in that many months have passed since the death of Ramah and everything that's happened there. Jesus's ministry has continued on in Capernaum, Chorazim, and Bethsaida and the surrounding areas, of course, doing what we see him do in the Gospels. And that's really, really cool to see. Like I mentioned in my previous overview of episodes four through six, this is the time when the chosen is going to need to be on a strict timetable as they don't really have any weeks, days, or months to kind of skip over or to 
kind of meander through. Their their time is done because season five is going to be Holy Week. And if that whole season is going to take up, you know, five days to seven days, I mean, there's not much that they can do to change that time, right? Those days are very specific days on the calendar because they are associated with Passover and everything that happens there in the Jewish society. So there's not much they can do to move around those time frames like they've done in the previous four seasons. For me, I love this because the time frame for me has been one of the biggest issues, especially in season three. And so for season four to feel more grounded, to feel like we know what time this is and where we're going, that is huge for me personally as a viewer. But as we go back to the scene inside Peter's home, first we start with Peter and Thomas. They talk about the last few months and how Thomas is doing overall. He's still definitely struggling, but he knows that he has to follow Jesus. In fact, in one point in the conversation, Peter actually asks him, hey, do you want to take a break for a little while? Like just get away from everybody, you know, and kind of recoup for a second. He says, I just can't can't. It's too painful to be here, but there's no other place I'd rather be. I love this line here because it shows that dichotomy within Thomas. It's not like he's following Jesus out of spite or just because Rama asked. He does love Jesus. He does want to follow Jesus, but he's also in a lot of pain during this time. So it's a both and. It's not either or which I love about storytelling. After this conversation, Simon the Zealot arrives with some fruit to the house and some cooking supplies for the ladies. Mary and Eden are cooking inside Peter's house. And we see as the rest of them begin to eat the fruit and pretty quickly, Philip begins to explain how to eat a pomegranate to Matthew. Now, this is a scene that I've already described and talked through a little while ago, but now we're getting the final version of it. And it is quite a bit different than we saw an earlier version of. A lot of background noise, a lot of added dialogue, a lot of really interesting things that make the scene a lot better. Of course, we see another acting moment from the new Philip, Reza Diaco here. I think he's doing an amazing job, although he does have a really low key role in this season so far. Nothing about him really focused on at all um, and so he has very few lines he's in the background of most of the scenes and the lines that he does have are really kind of minimal and, and i think that's a great place for philip to be at the moment um, we'll see where that kind of goes in the future and what happens to him as he grows in the group and how much more we really need to focus on him as a character i'm not 100 sure but as philip is explaining how to eat the pomegranate to matthew he actually gets interrupted by a lot of the other people at the table, mainly Peter and Andrew. The two of them are arguing now about how you eat a pomegranate. Of course, Nathaniel and some of the others join in and start talking about this. An argument ensues, and Jesus just can't even <laughs> at this moment. He looks over at Eden, and the two of them kind of give a knowing look like, oh, this is happening again. And then at some point, Jesus actually gets up and walks out to see Thaddeus and little James making some of the food for the dinner tonight. As they're preparing some of the ingredients for Eden and Mary, Jesus comes out, looks at them, and smiles. As he's coming from the argument inside to the quiet little group out here, he starts to reminisce about the days when it was just the three of them. And this, of course, is a chosen fiction. We know that Jesus did not start with Thaddeus and little James, but most likely with Peter and Andrew and James and John. They were probably the first that he called, at least that's what we see from scripture. But in the chosen, Thaddeus and little James are the first that Jesus called and the first to walk in his ministry. So they begin to reminisce about what those days were like, how the days were simpler and how they weren't as chaotic and uh, filled with arguments as they are now. But then pretty quickly, little James starts to get a bit more serious, talking about how they can't stay in Capernaum forever. Jesus says how wise little James is, and little James says it doesn't feel like wisdom, it just feels like something in, in his gut. That's when Thaddeus starts to speak up and talks about how Jesus has been saying that he's going to be gone more frequently, how things are going to be like when he's gone, etc. And then little James talks about this verse here from Matthew chapter 16, where it says that Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elder elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed on the third day and be raised. And so James is talking about how Jesus has been speaking about these things kind of in parables. And Jesus says, yeah, yeah, we've been talking about that. And he says, well, those people are not in Capernaum. They're in Jerusalem. And so he knows that they have to go somewhere else outside of this. We get this really unique moment where the three of them have this really somber sort of understanding of what is going to be happening. Of course, Thaddeus and little James have always been background characters for the most part. They've always been the supporting characters, kind of lifting everybody up, making sure that they're taken care of. And of course they get their highlights here and there, but for the most part, 
Those two have been really solid rocks that understand a lot of what Jesus is teaching and are really humble about most of it as well. Um, so here we're seeing that kind of played out in real time where they're understanding maybe for the first time that Jesus is going to die. And while they may not fully understand all of it, uh, they are starting to get the gist of it here. And it's a really emotional moment for the three of them as they begin to kind of delve into that. Peter then comes from inside to check on the food for Eden. And then at that same time, Julius actually rounds the corner to ask for Matthew to come and see Gaius. As Peter and Matthew leave to go to Gaius's office, Jesus tells the rest of them to get prepared to go on a journey and tell everybody to get ready to go. Now, this is really interesting. Of course, we have two main characters within the apostles that have a relationship with Gaius at this point. Of course, Matthew from earlier on being a publicanist and then having that relationship kind of build over season one. Then over season three, we see as Peter has this relationship kind of building with Gaius as he's fixing the well for Capernaum and getting to know Gaius and the Romans quite a bit. In fact, he probably knows Gaius better than Matthew does in some instances as he knows about Gaius's son and his wife and everything else that's kind of going on in his home. So, uh, there's a lot of really cool things that kind of happen here. As Peter grabs Matthew, the two of them actually go off to see Gaius, and there's some interesting things that happen along the way as well. I love this little small scene in between going from uh, Peter's home to Gaius' office where Peter and Matthew are talking, and they begin to have this really interesting conversation over the phrase, it's nothing. Peter says, it's nothing, and then Matthew says, why do people say that when they mean something else? And Peter says, well, they often mean it's nothing for you to worry about or it's nothing that you can do right now. And Matthew says, well, why don't they say what they actually mean? It would make things a lot simpler. And then Peter says, well, you know, it's, it's nothing. <laughs> I love these little mini scenes that they interpose between the larger scenes. It really helps us to get like this natural sort of human emotion through little tiny moments that actually happen during day-to-day -day life. The writing feels really, really solid here when we get these little moments that actually make sense in between the larger scenes. And so I love this little relational moment between Matthew and Peter. Then we get into Gaius's office. Now here we see as Matthew and Peter stand, we actually saw behind the scenes of this a long, long time ago, but we were convinced it was Quintus's office because we had no idea what was gonna be happening with Quintus and Gaius. But now we know that it's Gaius's office and that makes a lot more sense while we're seeing Peter and Matthew appear here in the office. So really, really interesting stuff. I love the way in which Gaius is using his authority here. Right as they get into the office and the people leave, he tells them to have a seat. And immediately, it's almost like he is having a secret meeting with them. He doesn't want to have this meeting in front of other Roman soldiers. There's nobody that's coming in and out of the room. There's nobody that's walking through like we would normally see with Quintus. He's having a secret meeting with two Jews here, which is highly uncommon, of course, for the day. So this is a really, really interesting conversation where we see Gaius is trying to warn them about all the things that are happening coming from Jerusalem and, of course, from the synagogue in Capernaum. And I love the way that he describes this. He uses Peter's own language. As a fisherman, Peter has these different things that he understands about fishing, when it's a good time for fishing, when bad things are going to happen. There are certain superstitions or lore around what is happening during the fishing time, right? And so Gaius uses a metaphor about fishing. He says, when there is a red sky in the morning, what does that mean? And Peter says, well, it means it's bad stuff is going to be happening. And he he says, well, if you look towards Jerusalem, there's a real red sky. <laughs> it's real, real bad. <laughs> so you guys got to be careful. You have to have a low profile. And Peter begins to say, well, I I'm not sure if we can do that. You know, like it's Jesus makes the, the decisions and we're just following him. We can't force him to keep a low profile here in Capernaum. Um, and Gaius basically says, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to make sure that you guys are safe. I'm going to make sure that everything is taken care of. Um, but I need you to keep a low profile and, um, and there's going to be consequences if we can't do that. Now, Gaius, as the new praetor in Capernaum, is under a lot of pressure from the Jewish authority and the Roman authority. This is getting really intense for him. And they're basically telling him, if you see Jesus and he's causing another uprising, you need to deal with him lethally. And he's obviously not wanting to do that. And so he tells Peter that if he even hesitates, they're going to start to punish him. And Peter says, what are they going to do? Fire you? And he kind of continues on. But then Gaius says, no, it may be worse worse, they could suspect that I believe in him. Peter begins to laugh, and then he thinks to himself for a second and says, 
Wait, Peter begins to think that Gaius believes in Jesus, and he straight up asks him, do you believe in Jesus? And Gaius says, I don't even know what that means. Of course, Gaius coming from a Roman background, he's got all these other gods and an emperor to deal with and a lot of different things within his family, but truly he is coming to a belief in Jesus. And of course, we've seen that over the last whole season as Gaius has been moving closer and closer to an understanding of Jesus and who he is since the Sermon on the Mount and probably even before then. So it's really cool to see this to come to fruition now because now that Gaius is in control of Capernaum, he doesn't have to hide a lot of these little things that he's doing anymore and he can pretty much overtly help Jesus in any way that he can as long as it's not going too far for the Roman authority. So here we're seeing something new kind of come out. They have a small conversation about belief and what that even means and then Gaius begins to almost cry and break down. And there's a really funny moment when Matthew says, uh... There, there, Dominus, <laughs> which was really, really hilarious. But of course, Gaius isn't really crying out of sorrow. They're tears of joy as he's realizing, and he, he he's free now to believe in Jesus in this position that he's in. And it's really making him into a new person entirely. We're not seeing this kind of stern, shut down, um, kind of chained Gaius. We're seeing someone who is free and happy and joyful and ready to live life in that belief in Jesus. In a lot of ways, Gaius is now the first convert that we're seeing in The Chosen. And we can even see here during this conversation as Gaius is talking about his belief in Jesus. He knows that Jesus can heal. He's seen it. Not only has he seen it, but he understands who Jesus is in his entirety. It's really, really interesting to see. He says, even at the end of this conversation, my son is as good as healed. And then there's a really interesting moment where he tries to give Matthew and Peter a hug. Of course, Matthew completely does not know what's happening here. But then Peter says, okay, quick, 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 quick. <laughs> and he gives him a hug. And then they begin to leave out the door. As Peter asks the question, did he just convert? <laughs> As Andrew arrives at James and John's house to tell them to pack and get ready to go on a journey, Salome and James and John begin to have a conversation again about the question. Of course, the question being, can we sit at the right and left of you in your glory or in heaven? This is Salome's request that she keeps on pushing her boys to ask Jesus. I thought this was a great way of combining the two different versions that we have in scripture. In one of the versions, it's the mom asking, and in one of the versions, it's James and John themselves asking the same question. But we see the same dialogue kind of throughout here. So I thought this was a great way of saying it was the mom's idea, but the sons are going to ask. So Salome isn't actually going to go to Jesus and ask him, but she's really, really pressuring her sons to kind of ask this question. And this is a very small scene, but that's what we see here, that kind of, um, you know, pushing of Salome to really uh, go into this and ask this question. It is interesting to say, though, that she doesn't really see the repercussions of asking this question, while James and John definitely do. As far as we're aware, this could be the last time we see Salome until later on at the crucifixion. Of course, we could see her pop in and out from time to time, but her main role, I think, from now on is actually going to be way later on in season six, where she shows up in Jerusalem for the feast and everything else that's happening then. Then we get to one of my favorite scenes of all time in The Chosen. This is when Simon Peter and Matthew bring Gaius to Peter's home and see all the rest of the apostles and Jesus. Now, this is a pretty major scene here. We see as Gaius actually comes into the room and immediately everyone is speechless. This is a pretty intense thing. They're not used to being around Romans and especially a Roman of this authority here. But Gaius confuses them even more as he opens his mouth and immediately the first word that he says is Lord. That is crazy. <laughs> if you understand Roman authority and Roman rule, this would never, ever, ever happen, right? The fact that this Roman official is calling a Jewish man Lord is such a massive, massive deal. This is something that you would only hold for someone above you, someone that is way, way higher in authority than you. And Gaius realizes that here. And this, of course, definitely shows us what happens in scripture as well. If we jump into this, there's several different parallels to this exact section happening here. 
Now, of course, this is Luke chapter 7. This is the centurion's servant. And of course, just like the mother uh, James and John issue, where we have two separate passages showing us slightly different stories, the same thing happens here as well. We have one where a centurion's servant is healed, and then we have one where a Roman official, uh, his son, is being healed. And so to kind of correlate those two stories, because they are so similar in their dialogue and how things happen and where it happens, um, they're, they're kind of merging these two stories together to make more sense of where that parallel comes from. So here's the first one in Luke chapter 7. And of course, we see here the same exact words that Gaius actually says. Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume you to come, but say the word and let my servant be healed. So in this section, it is super important to the writing of this episode, but also to understanding, you know, this biblical story altogether. Earlier during the conversation with Matthew and Peter, there's a section where Gaius says that he's not worthy. He's not good enough, but he knows that Jesus could do it. Now, Peter and Matthew have convinced him to come to Jesus and to ask him himself uh, to heal his son slash servant. And of course, of course, Gaius is now in Peter's home and he's talking to Jesus, talking to him, not as if he were a Jew or under him or commanding him to do anything, but asking him as his Lord, which is crazy. It's so crazy that the second time that Gaius says Lord to Jesus, Nathaniel says, did he just call him Lord? <laughs> like He's kind of like freaking out a little bit because this paradigm shift is way too much for these Jewish men to understand as a Roman comes to Jesus. And for Jesus, one of the main things that I wanted to point out in this is this phrase right here. Right after Gaius says this section here, um, you know, I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say, go and he goes and another come and he comes and my servant do this and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. Now this happened obviously in real life as he's talking to this Roman official or this Roman uh, centurion here. And we see that happen in real time in the chosen as well. It's so huge. As Jesus goes from, you know, he's talking to all of his all of his apostles and all the people around him, and he keeps on getting frustrated. And we're going to see even more of that in just a second. But talking to this Roman, this Gentile, this first convert to Jesus, he's marveling at him because of the faith that he has. Not only does he believe that he could heal, not asking crazy questions or like, or trying to trap Jesus in something else, he's coming to him knowing that he can heal. And not only that, but he can do it from a distance, knowing the power that Jesus has. It's really, really crazy to think about where Jesus would be in this moment. And of course, I've been talking about this sentence for quite a while, almost a year now, where Jesus says, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And this includes the apostles, <laughs> okay? <laughs> not even in Israel have I found such faith. So he's saying, not in all of my people have I found such faith, and certainly not of the Gentiles, right? So Gaius, in this moment, has more faith than all of the apostles. That's kind of what the scripture is saying here. And that's what the show is showing us as well. And it's really, really interesting as we get into the end of this episode because Jesus is really marveling at this. And it's a really important thing for him uh, to have this moment with Gaius because it shows us who he is as a human. And we're going to get into a bit more of that in the next scene here. But of course, Jesus heals his son and he tells him, okay, it's done. You know, <laughs> you're good to go. And Gaius completely believes him without even a second thought. And it's really, really cool to see Gaius get on his knees and talk to Jesus in this way. Such a change from the Gaius that we saw yelling at Matthew, telling him he's making a huge mistake in season one. Such a difference here. As Gaius leaves Peter's house, he actually passes by Andrew and James and John, some of the other apostles, and they are flabbergasted. <laughs> they have no idea what is happening here. Why would the, the praetor of Capernaum be walking out of Peter's house? And not only that, but he's smiling and looking at them and basically welcoming them as he, as he passes by. <laughs> uh, they're so confused. And I think in James and John's mind, this is really worrying because like they've talked about with their mother, if they don't ask for what they want, then other people are going to walk in front of them. And this Gentile coming to Jesus 
and talking to him is a sign of that for sure. They're worried that the Gentiles or someone else is going to take their place and become, uh, you know, more important in the kingdom of heaven uh, than they are. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's really, really interesting thought. I think that's kind of where their minds are going. And so in this moment, that's when they ask the question. First off, they start with a really mild question. Do you remember when you said, ask and you shall receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you? And Jesus says, no. <laughs> of course, jokingly, he says, no, he doesn't remember. Of course, he remembers what he preached at the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but they continue on and they begin to ask the question. Kind of gently and nervously, they approach the question. And then finally, John asks, if they can sit at the left and right in his glory, which of course is what we see in scripture here. Now, mainly this section is following Mark chapter 10, and it's broken up into a couple different sections as we go from the question to Gaius, then back to the group, then back to Gaius. It kind of moves back and forth quite a bit here as we're talking through. But let's go to Mark chapter 10 and read through this. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to, uh, to them, What do you want me to do for you? <laughs> then they said to him, him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. And that's where this scene in particular ends here before we cut back to Gaius. We see as there's silence, Jesus kind of is frustrated and in pain. And then he says, you do not know what you're asking. And then he walks away. We're going to see the rest of the scripture played out in a scene in just a second. Um, in between Gaius actually doing some really interesting things as well. Gaius is going to go and buy supplies to prepare for a celebration with his family since he knows that his son is going to be healed. Again, pointing to Gaius's faith. There's a reason why the chosen writers are doing this. It's not just because... Um, it's an interesting interplay here. They could play out these scenes separately, right? Have the Gaius stuff over here, then have the James and John stuff over here. But the reason why they want that interplay is to show the difference between the two faiths, right? We have James and John over here that they know what Jesus can do. They've seen what Jesus can do, but they're still not understanding Jesus's purpose, right? They're still not understanding who Jesus is and why he has come. And yet Gaius over here, is understanding why Jesus has come and is understanding how Jesus operates, right? The healing of his son and everything else. And so Gaius has this massive, massive faith while his apostles are missing the point here. Um, and so that dichotomy is really a powerful moment within this writing because we see this super big high of Jesus being like, wow, Gaius, you're awesome. This is so cool. I can't believe that you have this faith. You have more faith than anybody that I've seen in Israel, including my apostles, right? And then we have this super low right afterwards of John and James being prideful, and wanting authority as the world gives authority instead of as the kingdom of heaven operates. And they just don't understand. Um, and so Jesus has this big high and this big low. And then we see as Gaius is, is before he even goes home and sees that his son is healed, he's buying supplies, right? That shows his immense faith. Then we cut back to the group uh, where Jesus is on the outskirts of Capernaum. And we see as the group follows him and they get in this big argument, but we see a lot of this dialogue come into play here. You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism of which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism which, of which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or to my left is not mine to grant, but it is, it is for those whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we see almost all of this dialogue here, but we actually get a bit of added dialogue as well as Jesus returns to very plainly telling them what's going to happen, that the son of man will be taken and he'll be killed by the elders and the chief priests and that he will raise on the third day. And he, he talks about all of that as plain as can be, right? But they do not understand it. They're still questioning who the son of man is. They're like, I thought you were the son of man. <laughs> 
and then they're questioning what's going on. Um, even during this portion here, when he says to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, um, Simon Peter and, and Simon the Zealot both are kind of confused. They're like, who's being held ransom? <laughs> uh, and uh, and or who's being held hostage? <laughs> and it's like this really funny, interesting moment. But you can see as Jesus is getting more and more frustrated as they just don't understand what he's saying, right? Now, the Bible tells us that they were kept from understanding what he said because in my mind anyways, I think it's because they would have tried to stop him, right? Um, and of course, Jesus needed to go on with his mission. And so there are portions, I'm sure, that Jesus got frustrated that these things were happening, uh, that they didn't understand, that they didn't get what he was talking about. Um, and so here is one of those places in The Chosen, at least, where Jesus is definitely frustrated. And now we're seeing this huge difference between this Roman who could have such faith and believe in Jesus and just do what Jesus says then immediately afterwards, his apostles are arguing about who's going to be the greatest and they want to sit as left and right and they're just not getting it at all. And so uh, it's really an, an interesting writing parallel there that's, I think, beautiful. Really, really well done. Right after this conversation, Jesus basically begins to cry and gets really, really frustrated and sad. And he tells the rest of them, just get prepared and let's go to Jerusalem and, uh, and I'll follow right behind you. And they all try to give excuses and try to like join him and try to protect him. And he basically says, no, just go. I'll follow right behind you. And so they head on their journey to Jerusalem. Then we also get another scene of Gaius as he returns home. Uh, this was a great scene as well. Really, really cool. I love, 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 love how they had him blow out all the candles when he first came in. These aren't just decorative candles. These are candles to worship certain gods or the emperor. And as we saw in season three, he does have statues of several different gods that's of the pantheon of Rome, right? But also the emperor is considered a god within Roman culture, basically. Um, and so they would have candles and different things to worship the emperor and to worship these other gods, to venerate them within the home. Uh, and so the first thing he does when he walks in is he blows out a bunch of these candles, as many as he can, uh, before his family comes in and says, you you won't believe what just happened. And he says, I do believe it. <laughs> I know what happened. And with great faith, um, you know, he shows his family even that he knew this was going to happen before it happened. And of, of course, his two sons come out of the back room and his, his uh, son, who was a servant, is healed. And uh, such a great moment here. And immediately he tells them shalom, which of course he's learned from the Jewish people, meaning peace, and he teaches them how to say shalom, shalom. And then his wife in the background also says shalom. Such a beautiful moment here. It's kind of one of those moments where we're like, and then he was saved and his entire family along with him, right? And so that's kind of what we're seeing here in this moment, uh, as we've seen in scripture many times before. But I love the Gaius storyline. I don't think we're going to see too much more of Gaius uh, coming up in the next few seasons because he'll probably be stuck in Capernaum doing things for, for that town. Um, but a very great climax to his story here uh, as, we've, as we've gotten to the middle of the whole entire series at this point. And finally, we get to the last scene of this episode. And do not tune out because this is probably the most important scene of the entire episode, maybe of the entire show so far. Very, very well written. And I love the way that this came together. There are three main aspects here that I'm going to go through in terms of this scene here. We see as Jesus is in the olive grove uh, that Zebedee has bought. And he watches as uh, Zebedee, Tamar, and Mary are actually refining and making the olive oil here. Now, of course, as he does this, he's kind of talking to himself. And it's really, really hard to hear. But if you can grasp it, he's actually reciting Psalm 38. Now, this is a really interesting psalm because it's actually a psalm of David. And he's talking about his own sin um, and how God kind of approaches him in that. Now, of course, Jesus is not quoting this because of his own sin. But there's very specific points in which he's talking um 
to God about the situation that he's in right now, right? And he's using this Psalm of David to kind of do that. So verse three, he says here, there is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin for my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. Now, of course, Jesus is not talking about his sin. There is no sin in Jesus. Um, He's not quoting that portion there. This kind of jumps around a little bit. The main portion that he lands on is this portion right here. Um, He says, uh, for my sides are filled with burning and there's no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. And then this main portion here, O Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs. My strength fails me. And the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. My friends and companions stood aloof from my plague, and my nearest kin stand far off. This is Jesus saying, I'm alone. I feel alone. I feel weak and tired and frustrated because of where my friends are, right? So he's quoting this psalm, and then in the middle of him quoting this psalm, he kind of ends here. Again, this is pointing towards his friends, right? This is the writing that we're seeing here. It's pointing towards his friends. But then he sees as Tamar, Mary, and Zebedee are making the olive oil. And if you don't know, olive oil is generally made in three presses. The first press is the virgin olive oil, right? Uh, This is like the purest, nicest. And then as you go through, the pressings get deeper and deeper, harder and harder, crushing the olives more and more and more and creating different types of pressings. So the first pressing is used uh, for anointing and and, and really uh, spiritual things generally and different things like that. It's the purest. Then you get the second oil, which is used for different purposes. Then the third oil, which is generally used for like oil lamps and different things like this. It's, it's a pretty dirty burning oil, uh, different things like that. So it's used for different purposes, but this is a huge foreshadowing to Jesus in the garden later on the garden of Gethsemane. And this is the three pressings that Jesus goes through, which he's going to go through. I'm assuming in season five. And so this is a foreshadowing to that moment here. This is when Jesus asks his apostles to stay up and to pray with him and to watch guard basically in the garden of Gethsemane after the last supper. And this is of course, when Judas is bringing the temple guard to come and arrest Jesus and have this whole betrayal moment. And during this point, Jesus is pressed three times so much so that his sweat is like drops of blood. That is the correlation here. Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane, literally means olive press. Um, And so Jesus is in the olive press and he's being pressed three separate times. He prays, he comes and talks to the apostles, he prays, he comes and talks to the apostles, he prays again, and then he is betrayed. So that is how this kind of works here. Um, And and it's a foreshadowing to that moment in particular, but it's also showing how, how Jesus is being pressed even now right? Um, He's being pressed in this moment as he's approaching Jerusalem, as he's approaching the cross, as he's approaching what's happening here. A lot of people have had said this is the slow march towards the cross, right? Um, And we're entering the last few weeks of really uh, that being the case and, and, and it coming up to that moment here. It's really, really intense for him. And he's seeing everything that's happening and he's really wanting his apostles to understand and, and to be able to, to know what's upcoming. And he knows the pain, not only that he is going to go through, but all of them as well. And there's a lot of it to come. So the foreshadowing here is just massive. It's so, so cool how they're using the olive press here to foreshadow the olive pressing of Jesus in the future and how that's feeling for him right now. But then at the very end of the scene, Gaius comes in and he's really excited to see Jesus kind of happy. And then he kind of reads the room a little bit and sees that Jesus is in pain. And then he offers him a big hug And he just comforts Jesus. Something we don't think about often is how often Jesus would need to be comforted himself. I mean, yes, he was God, but he was also fully man. So how does that work out, right? There are times when he was sad, when he needed people around him. And this moment shows that. It's really, really cool to use Gaius in that moment. The only person who really is understanding kind of what's going on here. 
Um, very, very cool. Overall, I thought this episode was so well written. I think episodes four, five, and six are some of the best writing that we've seen from The Chosen so far. And I hope that they just keep on getting better as we go through the season. Now, there's so much that we couldn't talk about in this overview, and we're going to deep dive in this episode later on, as well as five, six, seven, and eight coming up very soon. Soon. <laughs> but stay tuned to the channel, subscribe if you haven't already, and like this video as it really, really helps out. Leave your comments below about what you thought about episode four, and we'll see you on the next one. Peace.